Um, thank you, guys. I just wanted to thank the whole school and the team for bringing me up here um, to share my story. Um, sometimes when I introduce myself as Muhammad Ali, people give me the look saying that your name is not Muhammad Ali or show me your license, but it is truly my name, Muhammad Ali. Bakiri is my last name. I came to Australia as a refugee on a boat. And um, during this journey, I was with my brother, his wife, and along with his four other children. And I had another nephew from an older brother who was with us. So six kids. And I was the oldest at that time. And the youngest being less than a year old. The reason why we fled Afghanistan was because of Taliban. They used to come to our houses and accuse us of having weapons and accuse us of changing our religion. And we didn't want to do that. So they used to torture us. Afghanistan has been in a civil war for more than two decades and it's still not safe. So with the help of a smuggler, we, we paid $16,000 to the smuggler and managed to run away. My parents did not come with me as they, they were really old and only wanted a future and our safety for us, for, his, for the kids. When we got to Indonesia, this was in 2001. Um, we were in Indonesia for six months before getting on a boat. When we got on the boat, there were 150 people on our boat, including women and children. And we came towards Australia, and it took us six days to reach Australian water on that boat. And within that six days, I remember we had so many rainy days, storms, where people were praying for survival. It didn't really matter whether you were Christian, whether you were Muslim, whether you were Buddhist. Everyone came together to pray for survival. And we did survive. On the last day, I remember seeing a bird flying around on our boat and I asked my brother, what is, there's a bird, what does that mean? That, and he reassured me that there is an island close by because for six days we did not see no land at all. We had no idea that we would make it or no. We had not enough water in the boat, not enough food, and people were really seasick. I was really um, seasick as well as I was throwing up. And on the last day, we were intercepted by the Navy ship of Australia. Um, and they, they basically told us that you have to go back to where you came from. And people on the boat panicked and said, look, if we go back, we might die. So we're not going to go. Unfortunately, on our boat, there were people who previously made the same journey to come on a boat to Australia. But they were returned back by the Navy ship of Australia who were forced back to Indonesia, they came for, uh, for the second time on our boat and they set our boat on fire. And this is in the middle of the ocean. The Navy ship of Australia is watching us. And as the, as the fire was spreading really fast, people were throwing themselves in the water. And the Navy ship of Australia was just looking at us, float in the water. I was holding one of my nephew's hands to give, uh, to give him support because I was the oldest of the kids at that time. And seeing a person die right in front of you, you know, sometimes I have nightmares of the exact moment when our ship was on fire and we all, um, we were all floating in the water and people were screaming for help. It took two hours for the Navy ship of Australia to actually rescue us out of that um, ocean. And two people, two ladies, passed away. And my own nephew, who was less than a year old, was unconscious for six hours. We thought we lost him, but luckily he survived. After that, they kept us, the Navy ship of Australia kept us in, on the boat on the Navy ship of Australia because they had no idea what to do with us. They kept us there for uh, over a week, and then they transferred us to Christmas Island. We were in Christmas Island, we lost all our belongings, and the clothes that I was rescued with I was wearing the same clothes for over a month in Christmas Island. And the government of Australia, back then, John Howard, told us that in order for you, for us to go to Australia, we will all need to go to Nauru. 
And we were happy at the fact that they will soon resettle in Australia. We'll go to Nauru. So we went to Nauru. As we were landing, I was sitting on a window seat. The island looked so small that I, I'm like, how are we even going to land here? You can literally go around the island in 15 to 20 minutes by a car. That's how small it is. They kept us there for three years. I was there without my parents. The condition of the detention center was horrible. Lack of medical assistance, people with psychotic disorders, people with mental illnesses, all sorts of men mental illnesses that you can think of. And at the same time, the facilities, the toilets were just disgusting. No lights, no fresh water. And the government, was, the government kept on saying to us that you will never resettle in Australia. You either stay here for the rest of your life in this detention center or you go back to your country or you go back to where you came from. So a lot of people, you know, they did so many peaceful protests and no one listened to us because it was so isolated away from everyone. No journalists were allowed to go in there. And there was a time that the government actually um, offered $2,000 as a bribe to people to go back to their country. We paid $16,000 to the smuggler for eight people to come to Australia. And they were giving 2,000 for people to go back, guaranteeing them that you have safety, protection, um, and we'll, we'll, we will make sure that you have a job. And those people that went back, they had no other choice. They have already risked their lives, yes, and they had to go and protect their families overseas. They had to go protect their kids and, and, and provide financial support to them. And out of those 100 people, I know over 20 people have been confirmed dead in Afghanistan who has been killed by the Taliban. And out of those 100 people, there are people who have made the same journey after 12 years, this time with their family, waiting in Indonesia to get on a boat and come to Australia. After when we, um, after, after, after we really, um, for people like us, we had no other choice, but we had hope in us. One uh, morning I woke up, there was a gathering, I went there, as kids we used to go and see things, you know, explore things. I was 10 years old, and I saw three people actually who stitched their lips, and you could see blood on their lips. And I was really shocked, and these people were denying to drink or eat. They, they wanted their freedom and justice to be served. And a lot of people in solidarity joined in the hunger strike and the hunger strike went for over three weeks and somehow uh, some photos were taken while people were collapsing and taken to on a stretcher to the hospital and it was on social media that's how people in australia reacted and found out about those innocent refugees in that detention center on nauru and that is how we came to australia we came to australia on a temporary protection visa basis not allowed to go and travel, I couldn't go and see my parents. When we come here, I thought the problems, they were, uh, the, the issues, um, they're gone now. But the struggles, they kept on um, coming. I did not know how to speak English. People were making fun of me when I went to school. People were bullying me. People were telling me to go back to your country. And at the same time, my brother could not find any work because he couldn't speak English. So that's why we had to go somewhere remote in Shepherd in a countryside area in Victoria to pick fruits, to f do physical work. And at, at, at the moment, I did schooling. I made learning uh, English my main priority. I, I ignored all the negativity from other people and just focused on learning English. I used to have friends from my own background, but I used to ditch them and go and be with someone who could speak English just for a purpose, as, as I had a purpose and I've achieved it. In year 12, I became one of the school captains, and now I'm in my final year of completing a, a double degree in law and business at Victoria University in Melbourne. Uh, my brother, on the other hand, as I said, he did not know how to speak or write, now owns a business where, with an Australian partner, he's employing over 100 people within the community in Shepparton. That shows that refugees, if they're given a chance, they can prove it, and they will become successful. So at the moment, because I've been through that experience, I go around to different schools, different rallies, different universities to talk about my story and to tell you guys that 
the people that are in the detention center, especially children, are not supposed to be there. They haven't done any crime. Our government should let them in. Instead of spending billions of dollars, instead of wasting our money on torturing people, we should bring them within the community so we can take care of them. If I had safety and security in my own country, I would have never left my identity and belonging and travel to a country where I have to risk my life in a rickety boat, be tortured, and then come to this country where the problems are still there, you know, with the language barriers. A lot of people say that, a lot of people say that boat people are bad people. How are they bad people? They're just fleeing war and persecution. My country, Afghanistan, has given me nothing except for pain and suffering. And there are, there are thousands of people at the moment that are in, 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 in detention centres around Australia and offshore detention centres. Australia is supposed to be a role model towards other countries, but they're just simply dumping their responsibility on other small nations in which they cannot even take care of their own people, yet alone take care of refugees. So I urge you all to please either write to your local MPs, write a letter or write a letter to children that are being kept in detention. Talk to your friends, talk to your families, talk to your friends' friends in order to raise more awareness. Because at the moment we do not have the media with us. The real truth has never been spoken unless when we do events such as this. And I'm really happy that I've been invited here and given the pleasure to talk to you guys. I'm in my last year of study, but because I'm so passionate, I want to get kids out of detention as soon as possible. And that's why I'm here uh, talking to you guys. Um, so I just wanted to send a few messages across. As an Australian, I'm ashamed of the government, current government um, uh, refugee policy. We need to remind our leaders and teach them about humanity about justice, about unity. We need to remind them that we are responsible for the deaths that are occurring in detention centers and on sea. Over 1,000 people, over 1,200 people have died coming to Australia. Over 2,000 people died going to Europe. Look at, look at Germany. Germany is so small, it's got a population of 80, 000, 80 million people. And they've taken accepted over a million refugees from Syria. Here we are having difficulties with, with a few thousand that is costing us billions. If it wasn't because of, if it wasn't because of um, the people um, around Australia who stood up, who became a voice, otherwise I wouldn't have been here standing in front of you guys giving a talk. So I would want to thank you all um, for listening and please share the story. And also, I've got a Facebook page running um, that I, that I um, update everyone on the current issues surrounding asylum seekers. So please like that. It's um, Muhammad Ali Bakiri. Um, thank you.